So my name is Eva Galperin. I am the director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I am also the head of EFF's Threat Lab, which uh, focuses on the protection of particularly uh, vulnerable populations. And as part of my work, uh, I spend a lot of time tracking APTs, so like the kind of stuff that we've been talking about uh, earlier in, uh, in this conference. I did a bunch of work tracking APTs in, uh, in Syria, in Kazakhstan, in Lebanon, in Vietnam, uh, and this was the kind of stuff that wasn't receiving a lot of attention from, uh, you know, from security vendors because there just wasn't a lot of money in it. It's not like uh, Vietnamese activists were purchasing a lot of, uh, a lot of enterprise uh, antivirus solutions. So uh, as a result, it very rarely got written about. Uh, one of the other reasons it was rarely written about is because this malware was not very sophisticated. So the kind of people who pride themselves on writing reports about, um, about malware often want to show off how good they are at reversing it and how good they are at, uh, at finding stuff. So there was just, there was no glory in this work. Uh, but what there was, was protection for journalists and activists. So uh, I went ahead and I did that for a few years. Um, I spent a few years doing that, and then um, in late 2017, early 2018, uh, I discovered that uh, one of my research partners, with whom I had done a whole bunch of this work, uh, was a serial rapist. And I was really, really mad. And one of the reasons that I was angry was that I read uh, a interview with, uh, with one of his uh, survivors. And she was asked, so what took you so long? Why did you not come forward earlier? And she said, well, I'm, you know, I was just this like teenage punk kid and he was a hacker. And I was really worried that he was going to compromise my devices, that he would break into my phone, that he would break into my computer. And in fact, he had threatened to do so. And I found this horrifying. I not only felt terrible for her, but I didn't want anyone to ever feel that way again. Um, I didn't like the idea of my people being the bad guys. And so I did what I usually do when I'm angry, which was I tweeted. And what I tweeted was, uh, if you're a woman who has been sexually abused by a hacker who threatened to compromise your devices, contact me and I will make sure they get properly examined. Um, now, I tweeted this like in the middle of the afternoon and then I went off to get lunch. And um, I came back and it had been retweeted 10,000 times. As a result of which, I became sort of a one woman helpline for uh, victims of this kind of abuse who are concerned about the, uh, about the compromise of their devices. And I would wake up every morning to somewhere between zero and 12 messages in my inbox of uh, people telling me the stories of the worst thing that had ever happened to them. That's a lot of mail. Uh, so there I was going through all of, all of these messages, and I received messages from, uh, from men who were being stalked by women, from men who were abused by men, from uh, women who were abused by women, uh, though the vast majority of, uh, of the messages that I got were from women who were abused by men. And uh, the fact that I had targeted my tweets specifically at women may have had something to do with that. I, I saw all kinds of things. Um, I, there was a um, gentleman who came to me because uh, his uh, partner had outed him as gay to his extremely conservative Korean family. Um, I had uh, underage girls come to me and tell me that they were being uh, blackmailed uh, they were told that somebody had, you know, naked pictures of them and would send those photos to everybody in their contact list, uh, unless, uh, unless, of course, they took more naked pictures and sent them to, uh, to their blackmailer, uh, to which I replied, you should tell your blackmailer that he is now in possession of child porn and he better run. 
So I was seeing a lot of, a lot of different stuff. And mostly what I saw was a lot of confusion over uh, what people's problems were. Because data is like water, and water leaks. So there are uh, different sources of leaks, I learned over the course of my, of my work. Uh, the first is uh, just humans, humans being humans, talking. Uh, it was very common to see the source of leaks simply be uh, someone's friends. Uh, it is not uncommon for an abuser to simply approach all of their victims' friends uh, under the guise of being concerned about their well-being and get all kinds of information about them that they would not know otherwise. Uh, this is extra super common. I saw it all the time. Um, the other form of, uh, of compromise that I saw uh, was account compromise. Um, email accounts, Twitter accounts, TikTok accounts. I had to learn what a TikTok was. Um, basically, uh, you know, Apple ID, uh, Spotify, uh, Nest. If it had a login, I saw it compromised. And there's sort of good news around that. Um, I know that that sounds sort of counterintuitive, but the good news around uh, device compromise is we have advice for, de for device comp or sorry for account compromise. We have uh, things that we can tell people to do. Uh, many things that have logins also have a screen that looks like this, which shows you who's been logging into your account, where they've been logging in from, what kind of device they're using. And so one of the things that I was able to tell people uh, who were concerned about, uh, about a com com compromise was to go look at these screens for, for their accounts that they're concerned about and tell me, do you see any unfamiliar devices? Do you see any unfamiliar locations? Uh, and that was a very good start. Uh, furthermore, we have good advice for telling people how to lock down their accounts. You can tell people, just change all of your passwords, make sure that your passwords are strong, make sure that they're unique, use a password manager in order to make sure that that's the case. And uh, when it comes time to uh, fill in your security questions, uh, use those as more passwords. Uh, otherwise, your account may very well be compromised by somebody who is close to you and therefore knows your mother's maiden name or the name of the street that you grew up on or the name of your first dog. The name of my first dog is a 40-character string. Uh, and finally, the other thing that we advise people to do when they're concerned about account compromise is uh, to turn on the highest level of two-factor authentication that they're comfortable using. There is a lot of argument over whether or not uh, some two-factor is better than no two-factor and whether uh, getting people to use, uh, to use tokens is better than not using tokens um, and whether or not they should be using SMS at all. Um, but my philosophy is that you have to meet people where they are. And usually I just encourage them to use as much two-factor as they feel that they can handle. Because if I walk into a room and I tell a, a victim of harassment and assault, uh, go buy a YubiKey, and she doesn't have 50 bucks for a YubiKey, I haven't helped. I've basically just felt you know, kind of smug, patted myself on the back, uh, threw on my cape, and then flew away. So not helping. But sometimes, sometimes it really is a rat. Uh, a rat is short for remote, remote access tool, also an adorable little critter. Um, so I did start seeing rats. And the vast majority of the cases that came to me were not rats. But the cases that came to me that, were, uh, that involved remote access tools were the ones that were most often linked um, to sustained harassment uh, and often physical violence, uh, sometimes the kidnapping of children. Um, these were by far the most horrific cases. These were the cases that kept me up at night. And we don't have a lot of advice to give to people uh, who have remote access tools covertly installed on, uh, on their devices right now. Um, 
the stuff that they have installed on their, on their devices is uh, usually referred to as stalkerware or spouseware. Uh, stalkerware is the entire class of software which uh, is designed to be covertly installed on a device, on your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop, uh, and to covertly exfiltrate that data to, uh, to the person who controls that software. Uh, the way that stalkerware usually works uh, is that it's extremely easy to find. Uh, you just go into your favorite search engine uh, and you type in, how do I spy on my girlfriend? How do I st spy on my boyfriend? Uh, catch a cheater. This is usually the framing that they really enjoy using. And uh, you, will get, uh, you will get a page. Uh, the page will offer you a, a variety of products uh, for, different, um, for different devices and different OSs. Uh, in the Android ecosystem, usually uh, you will either download it from the, uh, from the Google Play Store uh, or you will get a link to a, um, to a package that you can then go ahead and install on, uh, on the Android device. Um, we have seen sort of a proliferation of these, uh, of, of these um, applications in the Google Play Store. Uh, but we've also seen some, some efforts to uh, combat them, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, then what you do is uh, you give the stalkerware company your, um, your credit card number, and you pay for a monthly subscription to a portal. Uh, they store all of the information from the device, and they grant you access to it. So the extent to which they, uh, they know who is using this software, who is buying this software, and what information you're exfiltrating from, uh, from the devices uh, is, is really quite broad. Uh, again, how do you know that it's stalkerware or spyware? Uh, usually, they'll go ahead and tell you. The marketing is pretty straightforward. Uh, they say things like access to Coco Spy gives you the lead on how to spy on your wife with ease. You don't have to worry about where she goes, who she talks to, or the websites that she visits. You could also not worry by not spying. <laughs> um, this is my personal favorite ad. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an ad for a spyware product which is framed essentially as mobile spy app for personal catch cheating spouses. Um, the text, which may be somewhat difficult to read, uh, talks about how often uh, partners cheat, which is why it's so important to keep an eye on them, and then you too could be that guy holding that woman with the black eye. Make absolutely no mistake, this software is on the side of the abuser. That's their... That's their moneymaker. So it turns out there's an entire industry of, uh, of software that's designed to catch unwanted software on your devices, uh, also known as antivirus. There may be some antivirus people here in the audience. Uh, and so the very first thing that I did was I went to see how well uh, these antivirus companies did at, uh, at detecting uh, stalkerware on people's devices. And the answer was not so good. Um, I downloaded a bunch of APKs. I ran them through VirusTotal. And I got results like 7 out of 60 detect this. Or if I was in you know, particularly good luck, 10 out of 61. Uh, these were exceptionally bad results. And I was a little bit shocked. I mean, not surprised, really, but you know, disappointed. We're going with disappointed. Um, so I, uh, I went to the antivirus companies. I started with, uh, with Kaspersky um, because they'd had a bad year. And uh, I have no shame about preying on the weak, um, <laughs> at least not in this particular context. And uh, what Kaspersky agreed to do uh, was really quite wonderful. They agreed to create a new privacy alert 
for uh, for stalkerware where they found it on people's uh, on people's devices, so that you would know specifically this is the stuff which is on your device, and then you have the option of removing it. Um, which you may not want to do depending on how you feel about the person who is spying on you and the level of risk that you're willing to take because there is always the possibility that uh, if you further anger uh, your abuser that they might escalate to violence. This is one of the reasons why um, I always uh, want to put the decision making in the hands of, uh, of the person who is being spied on because we can't make that decision for them and if we do make that decision for them, it could potentially put them in physical danger. So Kaspersky added this, uh, this, awesome, new, uh, this awesome new thing, and they got much better at detecting uh, stalkerware and spyware, uh, as I learned in later research. Um, Kaspersky also put out a, uh, a report. Uh, since they started looking for stalkerware and spyware, they were able to tell the world uh, how much stalkerware and spyware they were seeing among Kaspersky's customers. And they showed that in the first eight months of, uh, of last year, when they uh, started tracking these things, that they saw a 35% rise in the number of uh, stalkerware samples that they were, uh, that they were seeing. Uh, they also broke it down by country, but proportionally it uh, was fairly consistent with the proportion of which countries use um, Kaspersky's products. So uh, it turns out that because uh, Kaspersky is a very popular product in Russia, Russians love spying on their spouses. Who knew? Additionally, uh, Malwarebytes put out a report. Uh, they had also spent some time uh, looking into this problem. They were very concerned about, uh, about stalkerware. Uh, my former colleague David Rees wrote a, uh, a blog post um, about uh, what you might do if you suspect that there is stalkerware on your device. Uh, and Malwarebytes reported that they saw uh, something like, I think it was 2,500 samples of potentially unwanted um, stalkerware on people's computers in the time that they were, that they were searching for it. So that's a lot. Uh, here we have a blog post put out by Lookout. Lookout uh, mostly does um, mobile antivirus, so this is particularly interesting. Uh, and uh, they also uh, set up a separate alert and uh, wrote, a, wrote a blog post about how concerned they are about this and got much better at making sure that they would find uh, stalkerware and call it out when it is on somebody's device. Uh, this is the post uh, that was uh, put out by uh, Malwarebytes um, not too long afterwards. So we have a lot of people who are talking about stalkerware as a potential threat, and we've got some antivirus companies uh, who have finally started to take it seriously. Uh, but what next, since uh, the, pro the uh, prospect of being a one-woman helpline for all of the uh, women uh, abused by hackers in the world is a little bit exhausting. Uh, it, not only is it exhausting, but uh, it doesn't work very well. Uh, it's a good way to get burned out. Uh, this is what we refer to in activism as the hero model, uh, where one person heroically takes on all of the work, uh, tries to uh, fix the problems one by one, uh, gets burned out, cries, and then is replaced by somebody else. Uh, the hero model is bullshit. What I strongly prefer is a coalition model. And so I uh, worked with a number of other organizations in, uh, in this area uh, to help create the Coalition Against Stalkerware. The Coalition Against Stalkerware includes academics, uh, people who run organizations that directly serve victims of, uh, of domestic abuse, and um, law enforcement, and also uh, security industry people and uh, AV companies. So the idea is that we will all talk to each other, and uh, as a result, we will get better at, uh, at solving this problem. And most importantly, I don't have to do it all by myself. We have an agenda. So here are the things that I am trying to achieve. 
through the Coalition Against Stalkerware. Uh, the first is to educate potential victims about stalkerware. It turns out that most people don't know that this is a thing that could happen to their devices. And so sometimes when they start seeing the symptoms when they're being abused, uh, they feel crazy. And they don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go to. Um, the second is making the detection of stalkerware by AV products the new normal. Um, I would like to see a world in which I am not telling people that they have to install Kaspersky or Malwarebytes or Lookout on their device. I can just say, hey, install any AV and it will find this stuff for you in a consistent and, uh, and rigorous manner. Uh, in order to get to that, uh, one of the things that we're working on inside of the Coalition Against Stalkerware is uh, just the sharing of samples so that not every company has to have you know, several engineers devoted full time to, uh, to tracking these things down. Uh, the third goal that we have uh, is uh, educating law enforcement to recognize stalkerware and take it seriously. Uh, this is one of the areas where uh, the goals around uh, antivirus uh, really dovetail with, uh, with the goal around uh, education of law enforcement. Because once you have antivirus on your, um, on your device and it consistently detects stalkerware, suddenly you can take that information and you can bring it to the police. Uh, you can prove that there is an unwanted uh, that there's unwanted software on your device. Um, sometimes you can um, identify that software, uh, and possibly the police could then go to the company that manufactures the software, which should have uh, the credit card number and a whole bunch of really useful information about the person who bought it. Um, my other goal is, uh, involves encouraging law enforcement and the FTC to pursue stalkerware manufacturers and the distributors that are violating the law. Uh, we have laws that are already on the books. Uh, one of the most recent cases that we saw uh, late last year is the FTC uh, going after a company called Retina X. Uh, Retina X made a whole bunch of the sort of top stalkerware products. And uh, interestingly enough, the FTC uh, did not punish Retina X for writing stalkerware. They punished Retina X for writing bad stalkerware that did not do a good job of protecting the data that, uh, that it was collecting. It feels a little bit like complaining this restaurant's food is terrible in such small portions. And finally, we will work with Google and Apple to keep the stalkerware out of their app stores. Uh, the harder it is to find this stuff and the harder it is to install on, uh, on devices, the higher the barrier to entry is and the less likely I am to find stalkerware on, uh, on people's devices. And finally, I have my own sneaky, broader agenda. Uh, and that involves reaching out to the people who work in the security industry, to uh, the people who work on UI, to people who do product development, and getting them to think about the domestic abuse use case. When somebody uses your product, what happens when they have an abuser? When they go through a messy divorce? when uh, they kick a roommate out of, uh, out of their house? Uh, what happens when somebody has physical access and the username and the password uh, to somebody's device but is not the authorized user? Um, and that's something that we really need to start thinking about uh, in a much broader and more serious way. Because mostly when I talk to companies about the domestic abuse use case, I get dismissed. I get told, well, that's a corner case. That's an edge case. That's not important. You've got other things to worry about. Um, but domestic abuse is uh, empowered by technology. And it is increasingly prevalent in our lives. Uh, and simply dismissing it as a woman's problem or, a, um, or an edge case is ignoring really one of the most important problems that I see every day. Uh, so if you walk out of this talk and uh, you come away with the impression that you need to move the people who have been uh, on the periphery of the security conversation into the center of your security design, I will consider this talk to be a success. Last of all, um, I don't do this alone because I am lazy. Um, 
There are uh, a number of journalists who have done incredible work on stalkerware. I want to give a shout out to uh, the journalists who work on the uh, When Spies Come Home series, uh, Vice's Motherboard. They did an incredible job, but they did it for years before I ever touched this issue. Um, I would also like to uh, give a shout out to some of the other organizations in the Coalition Against Stalkerware, uh, including um, Operation Safe Escape, which works directly with people on the ground and does a, a lot of the hardest and most like heartbreaking work around this. Uh, and individuals like uh, Harlow Holmes, who works at uh, Freedom of the Press, who has been doing the sort of you know tedious helping one person at a time work uh, and largely uh, like ignored and unheralded and in this for years. Uh, I would not be here without these people. And we would not be getting this level of attention if it were not for all of the foundational work that they did. Thank you.